So it is my great pleasure to end the day with uh, Sir John Curtis, who I believe, given the question that we just had about Brexit benefits, I believe, John, you're going to address the question, is Brexit over? So I guess um, we'll get some more answers to that question from John. Um, I hope you know how the technology works because somebody dumped me in this without giving me any briefing on how this hybrid stuff works. So I'm going to hand it over to you and hope you know what you're doing. Okay, thanks very much, Bob. We had a practice yesterday and we'll see. Um, can I just say, first of all, there's somebody who has been following this virtually. Uh, uh, a great uh, thanks to the uh, UK Interchanging Europe staff and also those at the Curie 2 Centre for making this work. It actually has been as easy to follow this virtually as hopefully it has been for those of you in the audience. So a big thanks for that. Um, what I thought I would do at this end of the day and to entice you to stay for a half an hour or so longer was to be slightly impish and in some senses question the premise upon which the last eight or nine hours has been based. So we've had, been talking in a conference which has been about uh, uh, British politics after Brexit. So I thought, well, maybe one of the things we should ask ourselves is whether indeed Brexit is over. Now, in doing this, I'm almost inevitably going to some degree either say the same thing or give a slightly different take on various points that have arisen in the many excellent contributions that we've had during the course of the day. Um, but what I want to do with, with this talk, in a sense, is to try to bring the threads together of the various aspects of Brexit and the politics of Brexit uh, in order to address, as it were, a larger synoptic question than perhaps we've been able to do in the individual sessions. And in doing that, there's then perhaps one thing that I think I might be doing that I'm not sure I've heard much about today, which is to look in particular at how public attitudes have evolved during what we might call the first year of full British Brexit. Um, it's now just over a year since the United Kingdom has been outside the customs union and the single market. So the evidence is somewhat limited, but I want to use such as there is to look in particular as to how attitudes towards Brexit have evolved during the course of the last uh, 12 months. So um, to give you some idea how I'm going to address this. So um, this sentiment was uh, echoed certainly in the session that uh, uh, the, uh, that Mark Harper and the Labour politician was that you know it, it, it you know it's basically it's all over the voters. So have voters heard too much about this? Have they given up? So have they at least accommodated themselves to the idea that it's happened and that the debate is over? And in order to address that question, I'm going to look at three things. One is, do most people therefore now feel it's working out, out okay? If people are going to accommodate themselves. Uh, to Brexit, if, if they're not necessarily originally in favour of it, then presumably they think it's working reasonably well. Do most people now accept the principle of leaving? Most people now say, well, we're out and we should stay out. And then thirdly, and this is something that has been touched on today, you know, do voters care anymore? What, what, what is their sense of Brexit identity? So that's the first bit. And then the second bit is, well, do people's views about Brexit matter politically anymore? We've certainly touched on this, including in the last session. So this is a part about, well, uh, does it make any difference to how people are inclined to vote um, across in a UK general election, but also in particular the role that Brexit might still be playing in the politics of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So let's just go through, I'll go through some of this um, uh, fairly quickly. Um, so uh, these are all polls that were done back end of last year, beginning of this year. So what do people think at the moment has been the perceived impact of Brexit on the economy? Blue line essentially means good, strike improves, strike positive. Orange line is more the more negative evaluation. As you can see on balance, depends a bit on which question you ask, it's something like twice as many people think that Brexit's not doing the economy harm than think it's coming up positive. So I'm afraid uh, Rhys Mogg doesn't get very full marks on this uh, criterion. It's um, also the case um, that Remain voters and Leave voters have very different views on this case. As you can see, 
for the most part, Remain voters are still very much inclined to give the view uh, that Brexit is being economically disadvantageous. And Leave voters, as they even were back in 2016, it's not that they're wildly saying, um, uh, yes, it's going to be positive economically. Um, uh, it's just that a lot of them say it's not going to say making a great deal of difference. But Leave voters and Remain voters still have very different views on this one of the central issues in the 2016 referendum debate. Another such issue, of course, was um, immigration, as has been mentioned on a number of occasions. Now, of course, the issue of immigration has moved on to some degree, and this is reflected in some of the questions that have been asked at the back end of last year. Um, they've not just referred to immigration, they've also referred to the idea, well, can we control our border? Uh, and that is a question that now, of course, in recent months has tapped the question of, well, there's those migrants coming across um, the English Channel. So bear in mind that the, 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 the issue has moved on. Um, the question on the right hand side, the immigration system, this is, you know, has Brexit improved or made our immigration system worse? Well, even here, uh, even with the, the question on the right hand side, which is less obviously tapping into the argument about uh, 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 channel migrants, People are more inclined to say this, the Brexit has been disadvantageous than advantageous. If you take out the middle option, which is true of the middle question, and you refer to, to are we controlling our border? The answer is no. So that central notion of the Brexit campaign is widely not thought to be being delivered. And again, here, however, this is not something upon which Remainers and Leavers are at wide disagreement, because actually on this issue, Leave voters are, are very often saying, actually, I'm not sure that we're controlling our borders either. So this is one interesting case where actually attitudes have converged, and I can show this on other uh, data on attitudes towards immigration as well. OK, um, third big issue, of course, in the referendum was essentially about sovereignty. Uh, to which I've linked the idea of influence, you know, how much influence does Britain have on the world stage? Because, again, in a sense, part of the notion of sovereignty is can Britain walk taller on the world stage? So left-hand side is, you know, has Brexit enabled us to control our democracy? Well, even, we're relatively split, but slightly more negative than positive. Has it improved our global influence? Well, lots of people would think it's not made a difference, but again, more negative than positive. Um, and again, it's also true for the third item. So again, here on this third item, negative evaluations dominate positive ones. And here also, Remain voters tend to give a negative response, while uh, Leave voters are either split or yes, they'll say it's positive. So again, Remain voters and Leave voters, after 12 months of full British breakfast, still have very different views on many of the crucial subjects. Now, what's happened during the course of the first, last 12 months to attitudes towards this subject? Have they become more or less positive or negative? On the economy, where we do have some data from YouGov, where the question's been asked more than once, looks actually, basically, people were pretty negative at the beginning of the year, and they still remain relatively negative at the end of the year not a lot has changed. Um, on the question of our position on strength in the world stage, uh, Delta Poll did repeat a question just before Christmas, a question they asked uh, the Christmas before, and actually, if anything, opinion has swung in a somewhat more uh, negative direction. Meanwhile, in immigration, there isn't frankly any question in the polls that enables us to look at whether or not we're able to control our borders more effectively now than we could 12 months ago. What we do have is YouGov's time series on the government's handling of immigration, which is, as it were, I'm trying to use as a bit of a surrogate. And as you can see, during the course of uh, last year, the beginning of this year, people's evaluations of the handling of immigration, at least, have become increasingly negative. That's what the green line means. So to that extent, at least, if that's a correct indicator, here also um, there are signs that Brexit, if anything, is getting a less good press than it would have done 12 months ago. What certainly is clear, there's a couple of polling questions, like one from opinion and one I'll show you one from YouGov, which asks uh, people a more synoptic question. 
The first is from Opinium. Do you think Brexit is going up, working better or worse than you expected? Now, a lot of people say, well, it's just as bad or as good as I expected. But as you can see, the balance of opinion tipped after the summer uh, into a more people saying it's worse than I expected than saying that it's better than I expected. And equally, in YouGov's question, has Brexit gone well or badly? The, this bit will say marked increase uh, after the summer in the proportion saying that it is going badly. Now, of course, it was in September or so of this year that for the first time, Brexit really became part of, of the central media story. We had the lorry drivers shortage, the food shortage, uh, the petrol shortage, the culling of pigs, something which, by the way, if like me, you wake up early in the morning, you listen to farming today is still very much uh, going on. Uh, this was the first occasion uh, uh, where uh, Brexit was, be was becoming to hit the headlines and there was concern about some of its impact. And it may be, may be that this helps to explain why attitudes have become more negative. OK, so what about the principle of Brexit? Where do we stand on this? First of all, just a reminder, because this is often got wrong, that it is probably the case that at the stage when we left the European Union, that there was probably a narrow majority in favour of staying. This is a poll of polls throughout the 2017 to 2019 Parliament. Uh, and by the end, it was 52% for remain, 48% for leave in a second referendum question. And no, the result of the general election does not contradict the polls because 52% of people voted for parties that were willing to hold a second referendum. Only 47% voted for parties that voted for the implementation of Brexit. The crucial thing about the, ref the election was the leave vote was concentrated behind the Conservatives. That's why the Conservatives won, not because necessarily there was a pro-Brexit majority. So we shouldn't therefore, and so that's an interesting baseline for us uh, to be aware of. But what's happened since Brexit? Um, so this is, there's not been a lot of them, but we've had polls, some of them, Still asked Remain versus Leave, though that's now very, uh, very rare. Mostly now they're asking rejoin or stay out. But this is just putting all those polls together and running a, a, a running average over the course uh, of basically since we left the formal institutions uh, at the end of January 2020. So uh, the yellow line are those people who want to be outside of the EU. The grey line are those who want to be inside the European Union. So immediately we left the institutions, that pro-Remain majority did disappear. And we had basically for a while, 52% to be out and 48% to be in. But that did not actually survive for long during the course of 2020. Um, and actually the closer we got to the cliff edge of what in the end was the Christmas Eve revelation of the trade and um, a cooperation agreement. So nervousness about Brexit actually increased. Then, however, when the trade and cooperation agreement was agreed, we did indeed move back to more people saying, indeed we got to around 53% of people saying we sh they would vote to stay out and only 47% to rejoin. But as you can see in the second half of 2021, when I've shown you, evaluations became more negative, then actually we are now back in a situation, even though we are now all the polls asking re rejoin versus stay out, which we know from when we've asked both questions on the same uh, poll, people are, there are some remain voters who say they vote remain, but say they wouldn't vote for rejoin. Despite that, we currently have a rejoin majority. Similar uh, pattern if you look at YouGov's in hindsight question where you can look track it all the way back to the uh, summer or autumn of 2016. Um, when we uh, uh, left the uh, European Union, uh, which is that the, the, the dip, so you go about two thirds of the way along, you've got 45% saying you're wrong, 42% saying it's right. That's immediately after we uh, leave the political institutions. 
as we go through 2020, increasingly people say that it, well, the, the result was wrong. The trade and negotiation agreement is negotiated, not immediately, but a month or so afterwards. Uh, the wrong lead narrows. But again, in the second half of 2021, and now more recently, we've been again getting back to on this question also, a very clear for wrong over right. So on this, certainly, are people accepting the principle of Brexit? Short answer, no. What's going on here? Um, uh, so here, I'm showing you now how those people vo who voted remain and leave and did not vote in 2016, say they would vote on the question of rejoin versus stay out. And there are two points to note. Number one is that actually, if you, for example, if you look at early 2021, only 7% of Remain voters said they would vote to rejoin, whereas 85% of Leave voters say they would vote to stay out. So yes, indeed, we were getting a stay out majority. But Remain voters are now more likely to say they would vote rejoin, and Leave voters are now less likely to say that they would vote to stay out than there was the case 12 months ago. But the second thing behind this, and this was something that was very clear throughout the whole of the 2017 to 19 Parliament, and again was another crucial reason why the polls were picking up a pro-Remain majority, narrow though what it was, is that those who did not vote in 2016, who of course are gradually becoming an increasing proportion of the electorate, are still roughly two to one in favour of being part of the European Union. So the truth is that as the um, mandate of the 2016 referendum ages, so it's becoming more difficult to get the polls to come up with a pro-out EU uh, majority. Now, still you might say, but voters don't care. Um, but as Sarah pointed out, and it's in her uh, paper on, uh, uh, in the book that's out today, and this is also the data that I was collecting uh, during much of the pandemic, this is the strength of Brexit identity. The blue line are those who say they are either very strong Remainer or a very strong Lever. It's waned to a, to a degree, but we've still got a, uh, just under 40% of people saying that either a very strong Remainer or a very strong Lever, and uh, only uh, uh, very, relatively few people saying that they don't identify at all. Now, these data end in August. That's the last time I've been able to run a survey. But again, as Kelly Beaver said in her contribution, um, it's also the case that um, if you track it during the course of this year, as Ipsos Mori have done, uh, basically the proportion who say they are a very strong remain or a very strong lever has not waned any further during the course of 2021. Oh, and by the way, actually, it's remainers who are more likely to say that they have a strong Brexit identity than are leavers. So, so far as my, the, the first question is concerned, it is frankly difficult to say that Brexit is, and the Brexit debate is over. But what about vote choice? So I've heard various views expressed uh, today. So this is a slightly complicated uh, table. So let me just walk you through it slightly. The two figures of main um, uh, entries, so the first column for Remain voters and the first column for Leave voters, that according to the polls up to the end of last month is the current level of support for the parties separately for Remain and Leave voters. Um, and you will, one of the interesting things now to note is that Labour support amongst Remain voters is now virtually identical to the level of Conservative support amongst Leave voters. So that crucial advantage that the Conservatives had over Labour in 2019, which is that they had corralled the Leave vote, whereas Labour had failed to corral the Remain vote, that advantage for the time being, at least, has disappeared. If you then look at the second column, you can see how support for the parties has changed amongst Remain and Leave voters since 2019. And as some people have referred to, indeed, Conservative support has actually, it hasn't fallen across the board as I have heard uh, uh, today, it's fallen most heavily amongst Leave voters. And the truth actually is that throughout the whole of this parliament, 
uh, when Conservatives were, were last in relative economic dif uh, political difficulty, which was before the vaccine rollout, then uh, and their support was relatively low. Then it was Leave voters that their support went down. It's the, the Leave end of the Conservative coalition has proved to be the more volatile end throughout uh, uh, this parliament. And one can think of many reasons why that's the case. Labour, in contrast, have now indeed had made some progress, but it's relative in gaining ground amongst Leave voters as opposed to Remain voters. But then look at the third column. The third column compares the position now with that in 2017. And then what you will see is that for both Conservative and Labour, the Brexit divide is still as strong now as it was in 2017. And if you go on to compare with the fourth column, it's still stronger than it was in 2015. So despite the best efforts of the opposition parties, at least both Labour and the World Democrats, to say uh, that they really want not wanting to pursue the Brexit issue, actually it's still shaping uh, party support to a quite substantial degree. Okay, um, I said I also talked very briefly about Scotland and Northern Ireland. Let me do that and then I will come to a conclusion. Does Brexit uh, uh, matter uh, there to the, uh, and particularly to the constitutional question? Now, I haven't got time to go through this in detail, but those of you who followed the Scottish independence referendum campaign of 2014 will remember that the politicians on both sides spent many, many hours arguing about whether or not an independent Scotland could or could not be a continuing member of the European Union. And if you ever want a case study in the utter inability of politicians to understand what actually mattered to voters on the issue at stake, this was a brilliant case study, because actually in 2014, there wasn't any relationship between people's attitudes towards the European Union and whether or not they voted yes or no. The SNP might have been in favour of independence in Europe, but they had um, always had a section of their supporters who said, what's the point of liberating ourselves from London only to put ourselves in the chains of Brussels. And equally also, which is what this slide is showing you here, in the EU referendum, yes voters split almost two to one in favour of Remain in exactly virtually the same way as no voters did. There was no relationship. After the Brexit referendum, however, gradually and increasingly, some people who had voted yes and uh, leave switched to no, while some who voted no and remain switched to yes. So that by the time we were getting uh, to 2019, levels of support for independence, which has still been running at the 45% level, suddenly increased. So while all our attention was focused on Parliament and the Brexit row, in Scotland, support for independence was gradually rising. And why was it rising? It was rising because what was already a relationship between attitudes towards Brexit and attitudes towards independence, which wasn't there in 2016, but by uh, the second half of 2018, if you look at the left-hand side of this graph, already at this stage, 50% support for independence amongst Remain voters, only a third amongst Leave voters. But then notice what happens from 2018 to 2019. All of the increase in support for independence, which was first registered in 2019, occurred amongst Remain voters. And that gap between Remain and Leave voters has remained in evidence ever since. And basically uh, now, the question of independence and Scotland's constitutional position is now bound up with the question of uh, Scotland's constitutional future in a way that was not true before 2016. 
Northern Ireland, uh, not an area like my expertise, and John Tun can talk much more eloquently about this, but just a reminder to those of us on this side of the water of the way in which the constitutional debate in Northern Ireland is certainly had new fuel added to what was already an intense debate. Exhibit number one, attitudes towards the Northern, Northern Ireland protocol broken down by how people voted in 2016. And basically, Remain voters say it's either fine or it doesn't need much adjustment. They are willing to accept the border down the Irish Sea. Leave voters who voted for Brexit uh, are very much saying that basically it probably should be scrapped. So uh, that's exhibit number one. And exhibit number two is that, of course, virtually everybody who voted um, uh, to uh, leave uh, is keen to stay inside the United Kingdom. They might have wanted to break up one single market, but they're very keen to keep another, as of course it's also true of the Conservative Party. It's one of the ironies of this whole debate. Uh, in contrast, uh, many of those on the uh, on the other side of the Brexit divide are now in favour of joining the Republic. So even if in England the opposition parties are not wanting to uh, pick up the apparent potential that still exists for there to be a political debate about Brexit. In Scotland and in Northern Ireland, at least, there very clearly is now an issue which is uh, bound up with the deeply political issue and politicised and still politicised issue of uh, the, the constitutional status of those two parts of the United Kingdom. So, just to summarise, far more voters are critical of the outcome of Brexit than are positive at present. Remain voters are markedly more critical than Leave supporters. On many indicators, voters are now more critical after a full year of full Brexit uh, than was the case. Seemingly at the moment, there is a narrow EU majority, and there are still lots of voters who have a strong Brexit identity. While it's less strongly linked with party choice than it was in 2019, it's still as strongly so as it was in 2017, and meanwhile, in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, this is still very central to the debate. So, of course, potential is not always realised in politics. It's uh, open to the politicians to decide where the future of Brexit uh, bank debate goes. But I think one has to conclude that so far, at least, that in much the same way as the 1975 referendum failed to settle the question of the United Kingdom's membership of the European Union. At the, at the moment, at least, it is far from clear that the 2016 referendum has settled the issue either, at least so far as public opinion is concerned. Thank you very much, John. That was really fascinating. I haven't got very much time to take questions, and there aren't very many questions on the Slido. So I'm going to take the one question on the Slido and something that I'd really like to ask you and kind of mould them all into one question to round off the day. And it's a bit of a difficult question, so I apologise. Just refuse to answer it if you think it's an unfair question. Um, but in, in public opinion terms, do you think we can separate people's attitudes to Brexit looking backwards to how they're tied up with the pandemic, and I'm interested particularly looking forwards, will we be able to disentangle people's attitudes to Brexit to the cost of living crisis? To what extent are these, is it possible to pull these apart in public opinion terms? Well, my, my answer to that, Paula, is that you and I and some of the other members of, of, of the audience are past masters in engaging in multivariate analysis of precisely the kind that's designed to try uh, uh, to deal with this. Of course, the difficulty always with that kind of analysis is that sometimes issues get intertwined. Now, I think the interesting thing at the moment, now, I mean, I'm more than willing to stand to be corrected, but I'm not entirely clear that at the moment that the critique of the cost of living crisis that's coming from the opposition is one that says, 
and it's Brexit what's responsible. Now, the now that of course is part of the general position of certainly the Labour opposition, which it is reluctant to seemingly blame anything on Brexit because it doesn't want to talk about Brexit. It wants to talk about inequality, and that was was very clear um, earlier today. That was, that was echoed in the, in the contribution from uh, uh, from uh, from the Labour MP. Um, so, insofar as that continues to be the case, then arguably they will be separate issues. I mean, in a sense, um, of course, uh, the Labour Party. I mean, it was quite. Uh, uh, clear today, who said, well, basically, so long as people feel poor, they'll vote Labour. Um, but of course, it does want to beg the issue as to what's the solution that the Labour Party is going to offer to people to the cost of living crisis. So, um, and that then, you know, at, at some point they've, they've got to come up with an answer to how they're going to deal with it. But I have to say that at the moment, you know, it's not entirely obvious um, how the things, but whereas in contrast, and again, I hate some coats, you know, very perceptive that gave us a portrait of what the Tory campaign would be. What the Conservatives have managed to do is to link Brexit to COVID, because, you know, undoubtedly one of the great public relations successes of this government in the last two years, and you, you can see it in the data that UK has collected with you, Redfield and Wilton, is the argument that um, because of Brexit, We've been able to get the vaccines out more quickly than other European countries. Now, of course, you can question that, but it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of PR. So they have linked Brexit to COVID in that way. And there is no doubt that the vaccine rollout is one of the things that this government gets credit for, even though there are other aspects. So that just is to illustrate the point that a lot of this interrelationship depends on what the, on what the parties do. COVID, at least an aspect of COVID, and Brexit are being linked by the Conservatives, and I think they have been linked successfully. So they may get be difficult to disentangle, even with clever multivariate analysis. On the other hand, so long as the opposition isn't linking the cost of living crisis to Brexit, then you might still be able to ply your trade. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to end with one very unfair question, but it's come through the slider, so I'm accepting no responsibility for it. Um, if the 2016 referendum hasn't settled the question, when will the next one be? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, you know, I think the answer is uh, probably not uh, for a while. Um, I'm probably not under uh, the, the current Labour leadership. I mean, I'll give you, I mean, the most immediate scenario um, would be, you know, a, a minority Labour administration, depending on the Wood Democrats. And Ed Davies says, well, I'll give you a choice of poisons, proportion representation or an EU referendum. I'll take either. Now, at the moment, as it happens, because Liberal Democrats have also fought shy of, 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 of Brexit, so unless they, they change their position, that's probably not the choice they're going to face them. So probably, probably not. But, you know, I mean, you know, it was pointed out earlier today that, you know, the Conservatives' advantage, given their age profile, is that um, older voters turn out to vote. Well, that's true up to a point for so long as they are with us. But a fundamental demographic uh, challenge that faces the Conservative Party and also faces the calls for the United Kingdom to be outside the European Union is the demographic profile of both of them. Unless, unless the Conservative Party can persuade today's middle-aged voters to switch to them, and unless the Brexit call can persuade middle-aged voters that actually leaving is a good idea, in the longer run, actually not picking up the, the, the question of the European Union again. And again, obviously, much also depends on how well the United Kingdom does or does not 
I do outside the European Union in activity, all that's potentially important. But, you know, I don't think we should necessarily assume, given the demographic profile of these things, um, that um, it isn't going to happen. Perhaps, you know, next five years, no, but maybe actually uh, within the lifetime of at least half the audience that you've got with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, we don't have time, I'm afraid, for any more questions. I'd like to thank you so much for hanging on for us when the previous session overran, and also for just an amazingly interesting presentation and good-humoured answers to some not very fair questions at the end. <laughs>